Dr. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Starting Over podcast. It is such an honor to have somebody who has your immense level of accomplishment and achievement in your life to come and share some of your wisdom, your knowledge and stories with us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Shannon, for inviting me. So I don't know if you know this, because I guess you're not part of the Instagram internet generation. <laughs> you're about, is it are you around 80 years old now? 78, yep. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So I don't know if you know, but there is a whole booming industry around nervous system regulation using your theory, polyvagal theory, mm -hmm. to help people heal, mm -hmm. grow, feel safe in their bodies. Are you aware of that? Not really, no. I have to ask my sons some of this, but they don't share it all with me. No. Because it is literally booming right now. Mm. So this is why I say it's also such an honor to have you, the real deal here. Yeah. Not, not all of us Instagram self-help gurus. Well, still able to walk and talk. Yeah, so that's good. More than that, I am sure. Well, I guess where we do need to start is with this theory that you have mm created as such polyvagal theory. Can you walk us through what that is? Yeah, I'll walk you through some of what I consider the, the most important points. Um, we all have more or less grown up in the Western culture, which basically thinks of behavior as being intentional and reactions as being cause and effect. So if you're upset, it's because someone did something to you. Polyvagal theory kind of says, uh, basically lifts the uh, hood uh, let you look underneath the hood, if we talk in car metaphors. And that is basically our physiological state, the state that our body is in, has a great impact on how we react to everything going on around us. So when we're in a, in a calm physiological state, we are more resilient, more accepting of others. But once our body gets more triggered into a state of defense, you know, more our heart rates start to beat a little faster, our muscles tense. Uh, we are irritable, we're hypervigilant, then we carry a bias that everything around us is negative or going to be hurtful to us. And the other part is that when we're in that state, it's the term is metabolically costly because you have to fight or flee, your muscles are tense, you're using up your metabolic resources, and the body doesn't like that. So if you're locked into that, your body might shut down. And you may find a lot of people who are, in a sense, in this mode of, fight flight and suddenly they become shut down and they shift from literally being an aggressor to being a victim. They oscillate back and forth. And then the real goal of polyvagal theory is to basically tell people that we, we can claim our evolutionary heritage, that we evolved to be a species that can literally calm itself through sociality, through social connection. Um, so which really is this remarkable point that we knew all along, everyone knows that when you're near safe, trusting people, your body gives up its vigilance, its defensiveness, and changes our perspective of the world. So when we're in safe environments, we can become who we really are. Mm -hmm. I guess this just shows the impact of COVID or how devastating that yeah. could have been for so many people with the social isolation. If you're suggesting that actually at its core, connection, connection with others is integral to health and happiness. Yeah. Absolutely. So what I, I actually wrote an editorial for a psychiatric journal on what I uh, basically described as the uh, conflict or let's say paradoxical effect of COVID on our nervous system. And that is COVID was a real threat. And what do we do when we're uh, historically, what, what have humans done when they're under threat? Well, they try to mitigate their threat through sociality, through interacting with trusted individuals. Well, what happened during COVID? those trusted individuals then be also became a threat. And so our nervous system didn't know how to calm itself. And so you had people having a lot of mental health issues during COVID. And then you're starting to see the consequences of long COVID. And we can get into that. Long COVID, like any other chronic disorder, can be identified basically by saying, you know, we won the war, we beat the pathogen, but my nervous system didn't get the message. So my body's still locked into a state of threat. You know, it, it's kind of like these, these, actually, there used to be these uh, stories and movies of uh, survivors after World War II who didn't know who won the war. And, and actually, in islands uh, out in the Pacific, not too far from where you live, 
the the issue was that the message of winning the war is important to give up the defenses. And our body is very much that way. We do a great job in fighting uh, intruders, pathogens. But if we defeat the pathogen, the nervous system needs some signal to say everything's okay. And it's not universal, meaning that we can beat the pathogen and sometimes the nervous system doesn't get the message. Can you outline how prevalent you think this is in terms of the impact of trauma or this invisible epidemic that I've been hearing it being discussed as? So let's talk about the impact of trauma. Let's kind of like uh, get right at it, which is the major point. And this is, if we go back and since move the clock backwards and go back 20, 30 years, people didn't talk about trauma, even in the academic world or even in the world of mental health. They didn't talk about trauma. They talked about the features that resulted in diagnosis. And they still talk a lot that way, like depression, anxiety, obsessiveness, autism. They use diagnostic categories, but there's something underneath virtually all those diagnostic categories. And that is a nervous system that is in a state of threat. It's defense. And that's where polyvagal theory really sits in. But what we had not really known until we started to ask these questions was what does the individual's adversity history, meaning trauma history in simple terms, it doesn't mean physical trauma in the traditional sense. It could be medical trauma. It could be uh, chronic neglect or abuse. There's a whole variety of ways that one can talk about trauma, but it is really saying the nervous system got signals of threat and was locked into a state of threat. And what we didn't know was what was the consequences of that, because everyone talked about physical damage, and it's still very much in the public press that if someone uh, is, let's say, raped and they're not so-called physically injured, what's the big deal? The issue is something's changed in their nervous system because their body underwent an experience of life threat. The same thing with uh, the shootings in, in public places and schools. <clears throat> The issue of the experience of being in that physiological state does it retuning. And this is what was not truly understood. We looked to see whether people had physical damage. We didn't ask. The real question was, did their nervous system retune to deal with threat as if threat would be a constant feature in their life? I mean, did they become hypervigilant? Did they start lacking the ability to trust others? And again, in the world that you're in, a lot of people are really saying, I just don't trust anyone. And if we start digging into their history, what you start finding out is that trust was violated, whether it was from a biological parent or someone else. The trust was violated and the body quickly learned not to trust others. Now, what I wanted to get at is that we started to learn that the, there were consequences, that this uh, adversity experience was really linked to autonomic regulation. This is the world of polyvagal theory that the traumatic or adverse experiences resulted in a nervous system that was now retuned to being more reactive, more defensive, more survival oriented, and less welcoming and resilient to interacting with others. And in fact, uh, we did two uh, survey studies during uh, COVID. And this to me, it was one of the most remarkable findings that I, I, I actually didn't even believe because we didn't measure physiology, we merely asked people about their physiological reactions, their physiological state, whether they had gut problems or cardiovascular problems, general questionnaire that I had developed. And I call it the body perception questionnaire, but it, it basically measures uh, subjective measurements of autonomic reactivity. And what we found out was that adversity history mapped into autonomic reactivity. So the more adverse their history, the more reactive their autonomic nervous system was meaning dysregulated. Now, mm -hmm. the part that links to COVID is this interesting issue, is that we all thought, uh, well, uh, you know, maybe trauma is a pre-existing condition and it's related to uh, the adverse effects of living through a pandemic, like more anxiety, more worry, more depression. The answer is yes, more greater adverse history, a more symptomatology. But if you looked at their subjective autonomic reactivity, the, the path was from traumatic event through autonomic reactivity to outcome, T 
to emotional reactivity. So it wasn't direct causality from the traumatic event. It was if my autonomic nervous system got retuned to be in a state of threat, then the symptoms of mental health were greater. Now, we did a follow-up. We had about 2,000 people in the study. And uh, the may first paper was really on those who did not get COVID. So we just merely looked at people who had no COVID, didn't have it before or during our study. But when we collected our data, we had data on about 100 individuals who actually had COVID. And we just parsed them from the initial research or uh, analysis. But when we looked at those 100 people, none of them were on that low end of adversity. So if you had no adversity history, either medical or or uh, medical or psychological, if you didn't have any, you didn't get COVID. They weren't represented in that 100. But wow. if they had high, co high adversity, they were basically, it was almost causal. It was like 80% who had a lot, lot of adversity. Now, this was 100 people out of 2,000 who got COVID. So it was a small percentage. But even in that small percentage, we could make a very strong prediction. The interesting part, let me kind of reframe this. Uh, this was March through May of 2020. This was early in, in the pandemic. So having gotten COVID early doesn't mean that uh, if you didn't, basically, it doesn't reflect on, because COVID went through so many variants that many people who didn't have any adversity history start getting COVID. But in the early wave of COVID, those were the vulnerable people. And this was literally, I would say, lethal lethal COVID. And so there's this complexity about adversity history, retuning autonomic nervous system, and vulnerability to the pathogen. And if you don't get the pathogen, susceptibility to the psychological factors associated with the pandemic. It's a, it's a story that really is not well known, especially in the medical community, because we talked about pre-existing conditions, or at least the medical profession started to talk about that. But what did they mean by that? Diabetes, heart disease, but primarily they talked about obesity. Hmm. I think, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of people listening who perhaps find themselves in this situation where they have had a lot of adverse experiences in their life and mm -hmm. feel as though, well, what I'm hearing is okay. that okay. I am I am doomed to, okay. Okay. Let, you know, contract let, let, a lot of, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> let, let, let's let's start talking about some success stories here. And we'll, yes, yeah, so let's bring we'll, in, let's we'll bring in a cast success it, story. Actually, this is an interesting uh, study that we did with body psychotherapists and found out now body psychotherapists, uh, a high percentage of them had adversity histories, but their autonomic reactivity by being body psychotherapists, interacting and delivering service was much lower than the normative data. So in a sense, they had the adversity history, but through their own actions and profession, they were actually going through self-healing, self-corrections. And what this is really always tells me that the most powerful, so you start talking about hacking the nervous system, especially the vagus. The most powerful hack that we have is our own sociality. That if we wanted to, in a sense, calm our nervous system, we don't need to put an electrode on the vagus. We merely need to feel safe in the presence of others and have trusting relationships, and the body will do the rest. And, and if that's difficult, and this is something that I've learned from my therapist friends, uh, many people feel very uncomfortable with others. You know, this is part of the trajectory of a trauma history. But they feel very safe with their dogs, cats, and horses. So they start using other mammals as co-regulators or vagal nerve stimulators. So the issue is we kind of know what we feel safe with. And there's a reason why people don't feel safe with other people. Often there's a very deep history of abuse. Now, that requires a lot of therapy and very skilled therapy to work with people, not merely to go over the psychological features, but to come to grips with their own physiological state changes when they start to approach the features. Like th there will be women that I've met that if my voice starts drifting down into a lower frequency band, they can't handle it. They, they, wow. In fact, they, what, what one woman who was a, who was a psychiatrist says, look, she said to me, Steve, when you talk, your voice gets lower. It triggered me, uh, my father. I, I see my father and I get like this. 
And, uh, you know, the point is that she was at least aware of the features that were triggers to her body. And Lise was able to say, it's the acoustic features of your voice that are bringing up these visceral bodily feelings that are triggers to me. And that's a deep awareness. And that's a important step on a journey because what people in terms of therapeutic models, they literally titrate. Uh, so if you know you're getting triggered with male lower frequency voices, let's listen to just a few seconds and let's see how your body does. And then when you, you start, in a sense, you learn that this is not going to be injurious to you. And is this all occurring on the nervous system level or is there a link here in terms of our subconscious mind? Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about uh, what's awareness and what's not awareness, what's intentional and what's not intentional. Remember, the moral veneer of growing up in a Western society is that all our behavior is intentional. But what we realize is that when it, that's how we project our values on others. But when it comes to us, we, we basically always want to say, well, you know, I, I had to do it. I had no choice. I have these feelings or I get triggered. And I, and I, when I use the term triggering, what I really I am talking about is my physiology shifts. What do I do with that shift in physiology? And a lot of people uh, do what I call ride that horse. They get activated and they use that energy to lash out at whoever's across the table from them. And that's mm -hmm. why you have, you know, spousal issues or partner issues, not the reason why, but it can Or against themselves. It can be the same thing. Yes. Because they don't want to hurt others. They start hurting themselves. So, but the issue is if they merely could separate uh, the source of the stimulation to the bodily feeling, and that becomes very difficult. So the source of the stimulation triggers automatically. And this is why polyvagal theory uses the term neuroception, because it's a detection of a signal of threat. It's not the perception. It's not like I perceive it coming from you. My nervous system detects threat. I don't know where it comes from. It's like someone, okay, a gun goes off and your body goes into a, a shock. You don't know where the sound came from, but your body detected threat and you tense up and become vigilant. Okay, so your body detects these things, but what is most interesting to me is you become aware of those bodily feelings. So you're not aware of the source of, of the of the stimulation, but you're aware of the stimu of the response. The body shifted. It's in my gut. I feel it there. Now the next step is what do I make of it? What meaning do I make of those feelings? And this becomes, uh, this is the world of, of psychotherapy. Meaning of those reactions is the difference between a saying, oh, wow, what an unusual feeling for this situation to, why did you do that to me? Why are you looking at me this way? Why are you, you know, it's this whole notion that we have to see ourselves as being reacting to something. We try to elevate ourselves almost into a justification of being upset as opposed to the curiosity of what the hell is going on in my body. You know, I'm mm -hmm. sitting across from you having, you know, a nice meal. Suddenly, I'm having these feelings. What's going on here? Where is this from? What, you know, so it's this uh, understanding of what's going on in our body. Now, what polyvagal theory starts to emphasize is, is that uh, those feelings are subjective uh, expressions of our autonomic state. So we're trying to give validity and science to feelings. And psychology didn't really have a good, let's say, lexicon for feelings. And it didn't really want to accept it. So when you do psychological studies, you don't say, oh, why are your feelings while I'm doing this experiment versus if you're happy, it's going to be different than if you're sad or scared. No, we just run a lot of subjects and assume this kind of like uh, washes out. So we can talk about stimulus response relationships. Polyvagal theory emphasizes the intervening variable called the, the organismic or mediational variable. What's in between the stimulus and the response? And recently, I run across Viktor Frankl's book. Well, I read that when I was a graduate. Man's Search so for Meaning. Yeah, I read that when I was a graduate decades ago. But there's a part where his ideas are used to talk about the space between stimulus and response. That's we mention this a lot. We, we talk about this a lot, or I cite it a lot on the podcast. This is polyvagal theory, that space between stimulus and response. 
is polyvagal theory. And that's where therapy works. It's saying if we create space, we can explore the reaction, the neuroceptive reaction when the stimulus triggers the body before we make meaning and uh, basically commit ourselves to a behavior. And what Frankel says is in that space is free will. It's the choice to behave or not behave. But that requires spreading out and awareness. And so I think part of this journey of what being a human being is not neuroception. I mean, because we're wired to detect threat, but it's the interpretation of the interoception, the feelings of our body when our body moves through these states of dysregulation. Mm. So I guess this is really, as Victor Frankl said, it's that space which permits us to have the freedom to choose an alternative way. Yeah. And is this, according to you, where change can happen and where you have seen that in people? I think, yes. I mean, this is, if I were, I think a change occurs when we create that space. We slow things down. Really, what, what I'm saying is change occurs when we become aware of what our body is doing. And when we become aware of that, we both honor our body and listen to it in a different way. So if we become startled and mobilized, uh, the normal reaction is to take that as a true threat and then use the energy to lash out at someone else. But with a therapeutic model, you say, well, my body went into that state, but maybe it's not, maybe it's not necessary for me to react. Maybe I need to literally sit with it for a moment, process it. So there are types of therapies like internal family systems, which uses the concept of parts. So what this is really saying from a polyvagal lens is that parts are really shifting different physiological states. So we can make them into one model by saying, look, when I get triggered into a fight flight state, my natural behavior is to protect. And if I get triggered into a shutting down state, my natural behavior is to disappear or be submissive. But when I get triggered into a social engagement one, I have flexibility because I feel safe enough to explore life. Mm. And the beauty about being a human, or let's say being a mammal, is unlike other vertebrates or ever living systems, we have a system to detect safety where virtually all other Living organisms, even plants, it's detection of threat, on the, even on the cellular level. But with mammals, we detect signals of safety. And we can see this like from birth. When a baby is crying, what calms the baby down? The melodic voice of the mother. So the intonation of vocalizations is a profound trigger that's wired into our DNA to, to calm down, to be safe. What is interesting, I would say even more interesting, is that what are those vocal vocalizations actually representing? The laryngeal and pharyngeal nerves are what creates the intonation of our voice. And in species, meaning other mammals that don't have language, they're communicating to their conspecifics, meaning those of their species, whether they're safe to come close to or not by the intonation of their voice. Hmm. And in fact, think about what the mother's doing to the baby. The mother is using a prosodic voice, which is the same voice we would use with our pets. Uh, if we want to calm a horse or a dog or a kitten, it would be the same way. We would talk with a melodic voice. And it's not by accident. We didn't learn to do that. It's wired into, in a sense, sending cues of safety. That's why... Certain people's voices are, let's say, people like to listen to them when they talk and others, they would basically turn off and want to do something else. And you're doing podcasts. You, you, you're you privy to a lot of, you learn a lot very quickly from the guests that you have based upon the intonation of their voices. If the voices don't have intonation, it's hard for you to stay tuned in. That is so true. I think also there's a quote from Maya Angelou where she says, people don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel or how you said it. Yeah. And I think that's often, it is often the yeah. case. Yes. Yeah. So you say there are many people who suffer from trauma or chronic anxiety. And 
these experiences are often clouded by a sense of confusion and doubt. I want you to elaborate on that because this for me stood out as a point that people might not be able to detect potentially or understand the the trauma that they do have, but they have this lingering, these lingering heavy feelings of fear, of shame, of and then these experiences of confusion and doubt as well. Yeah, it's because, again, uh, let's put the culture that we're in. We think we have to have a narrative to explain our experiences and our feelings have to have causes. And what happens for a lot of people is they have feelings that they can't link to specific events. So in a way, they start making up narratives that would make sense to them. So it's always going to be very confusing. So a lot of the, I would say, uh, I've actually only mentioned uh, Deb Dana, who is a psychotherapist who in, uses polyvagal theory in her intervention. And what she does is not even get into the stories. She doesn't want to hear the story. She wants to, in a sense, deal with the physiological state, talk about how you feel the body. Don't, because the narrative literally locks them out of those feelings because they start building that justification for having those feelings as opposed to exploring the feelings. So the doubt, the confusion is trying to put the narrative together. And often the memories are really uh, diffuse memories because they may have occurred early in life. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, of numbness and attempts not to remember. And if you step into the world of trauma, the first, I would say, one of the primary strategies to those who have survived abuse is to become numb to their body. So they start turning off the natural feedback loops that the body has to inform us about what's going on in our organs and on, in our different parts of our body. So we become numb and we no longer think of feelings as a major problem portion of our life. We think of objects and events. We do things and we keep moving and that's who we are. And do you think it could be possible to overextend into the feelings though? Like there, there is a lot of talk about, you know, you have to feel it to heal it, but is there, is there a part where we can o- um, over I, I, I know where you're going with that. You're, you're really saying self-indulgence. Uh, there's a degree of pragmatic strategies and that is uh, and also an understanding that this construct that's used frequently in the world of trauma is that is to resolve feelings. But that resolution often is not in the conscious realm. It often takes time. It's like when you get upset, you may actually start a time clock. You say, well, you know, when I get upset, it usually takes 30 minutes or an hour. So maybe I'll go for a walk and I'll feel better. So it's like saying I can learn to manage my bodily feelings once I get a, a sense of what the script is. So it's not like the feelings are bad and I, or I need to bathe in them. You know, we have to be pragmatic. We live complicated lives. We often have families and we have responsibilities in our jobs. And we have our own definition of what success is. And we tend to strive for that. We're in these various uh, highly motivated uh, trajectories, often without an endpoint of let's say, feeling the satisfaction or success. Mm-hmm. So I think this That's becomes one of the tragedies in life where the motivation to be successful uh, is what keeps people working, but they never reach a point of transformation from their success. That is such a good point. Has that ever happened to you or anyone else you know? Well, it happens to everyone around me. I mean, I desperately tried to take... Uh, uh, let's say, okay, my academic history, of course, was, you know, as a professor. And so you have all these various bars you have to reach. You get tenure, you get promoted to associate, you become a full professor, you need, but not just a full, that's not enough. You have to be a special full professor. And you have to merely not just publish papers, you have to get lots of grants, you have to get awards. They're always changing the bar. So if you pragmatically look at that as an assistant professor, you know, this is pretty crazy. It's just going to be a, a, you're just chasing things and you'll never feel comfortable. So I had embedded in my own life the idea that whenever something good happened, I would basically reframe who I was, you know. But I will tell you that is not the same as what my colleagues were doing. They were living 
living the fear, living the fear of being, uh, uh, basically losing space, losing prestige, losing recognition. And it seemed pretty hollow and unsatisfactory to me. But I wouldn't say that, uh, I think in general, the academic world is very structured to keep people feeling insecure through the whole duration. And then it, it, the capstone is you age out. So <laughs> they might throw a party for you, but you age out and you get gently or more aggressively pushed out the door. So it, it's, it's a strange world where we uh, are not really groomed to acknowledge our own successes, but attend to be groomed by acknowledging the fear of not getting certain acknowledgements. And I don't think that's just your industry. I think this is the way that we have created our society and, and many workplaces where it's, it's so difficult to be present and live in the moment because we're always chasing the next thing. We have, so we have yeah. performance reviews. We have the next promotion we're supposed to get, the next step. I want to come on to a theme about intergenerational trauma. It's not something we've really explored on the podcast before, but I know that it is, it's, it's gaining more interest, I, I guess, and more general acceptance. But what I did want to run through you is something that I saw. It's probably quite reductive. I came across something that spoke about how trauma is passed on through the generations, but it has taken a different uh, a diff- it's had different effects according to these generations. So somebody said, okay, if we look at what would be, say, my grandparents, first generation, they experienced war, natural disasters, colonization, poverty, immigration, more physically exhausting work, domestic violence. And then on to the second generation, my parents who might have experienced more racism, financial mm. stress, aggression, um, PTSD, domestic violence, repressed emotions, addictions, and onto this third generation now, w- of which I am a part that has, where they say that there's more anxiety, depression, perfectionism, burnout, people pleasing, codependency, emotional numbing. What is your take on this general idea? Well, I, there's one common thing that keeps going on. This is what I call feeling safe enough. Um, everything is about safety, and what that really means is the world uh, that's defined by the people with whom you have a trusting relationship with, whether you call it connection, love, family, or it, it, whatever terminology you want to use, but feeling safe enough not to be in a state of threat. And part of what we're dealing with this newer, the last, the, where we are now, is that so much of the social interaction is not very social. So even like using the term social media, uh, social uh, people would ask, have asked me, what would I do to the world to make it different? I'd say get rid of social media because it tricks nervous systems into thinking that there are real relationships. Now we're on a Zoom like uh, platform now, and it's certainly better for me than just talking to you on the phone, but it's not the same as being present with you. And people are creating their whole life relationships in these two-dimensional screens. Uh, so their bodies are not getting the fullness of what they need. And some of them are building it on text. And our nervous system is really not word-oriented as much as intonation-oriented, how we sound, uh, how we our gestures, and the contingency we have with others. So are we looking at the other person? Are we engaging? Are we nodding? Or are we turning away? Are we dismissive? Or as when you talk to, I pick up my phone and start texting someone else. This is what's going on in our current world. And even though it's a type of connectivity, the nervous system doesn't feel safe with that type of connectivity. It's to me, it's very disturbing, but I will go back and say, like, if you were to ask a bunch of children about playing, they might look, look around for a screen to play with. Now, when I was growing up, playing was going outside, finding someone in the neighborhood to do something with, you know, and, and this is not necessarily the world that everyone lives in now. Mm-hmm. And another part that was really kind of, I've been tracking lately, I was trying to figure out the population of the world when I was like born, not the world, of the United States. 
it was like 130, 140 million, not 340 million. So the density of population is greater. Uh, and so our whole society is feeling a sense of compression of space. And part of that compression now is a space of which there are people who are strange to us in, and that triggers the feelings of threat and defense. And this also triggers feelings of anti-immigration, a variety of other things. Not that that it, it, it's just trying to labeling a, a, a nervous system that would like a simpler life. And unfortunately, you don't make your life simpler by merely excluding people from your country. It, that, that's not the way it's done. You organize space, you organize places of safety, and you acknowledge that even during the early parts of the 20th century, there were large cities where immigration occurred with high population density. So it's not the issue of population density, it's whether or not people within those populations feel safe enough. Hmm. And to go to this idea of the the different types of trauma or how that's being passed down, do you think there's any validity in that? I think there's a common theme, and I think, uh, okay, so if you track uh, immigration patterns, and this is really what you're doing, and I like to use the word uh, not intergenerational, but transgenerational, because I feel that it just gets moved through and people label it in different ways. So in, in the United States, the, okay, so my grandparents were the immigrants. My parents were for, uh, basically first generation, and I'm second. And the issue, even by the time I was born, the real, uh, I would say the mandate was to fit in. You know, it was like, you know, to basically fit in, to, to, be, to in a sense say, you know, be an American, to fit in. Now, that's in the sense of saying that is privilege because fitting in is often influenced by skin color. And so... Skin color or being white is different than brown or yellow or really dark tones because that's distinctive. That makes you look different, and that's hard. So the words like you could pass, you could pass like someone who's been there for generations. But there is also a idealized view of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the wealthy, and I think that's still going on in a sense. But what we learn I, as the veil is lifted from the lives of celebrities and those wealthy is that these people's lives verge on being horrible. They're not, in a sense, anything that one would aspire to be. You wouldn't want that type of vulnerability, even if you were, you know, one of the wealthiest people in the world. You, you don't want that. And I think that's part of the illusion that we tend to have is that is if we achieve enough, if we acquire enough, will be safe enough to be who we are. And it doesn't quite work that way. This is a big theme in, in your book that you wrote with your son, Seth, isn't it? And really, when you distill it all down, you say it's establishing safety in our bodies. Yeah. Well, just think about, uh, okay, so if we threw away most psychological diagnosis and just said safe in the body, not safe in the body, all those diagnoses, we would call it anxiety or depression or obsessive compulsive, or PTSD, or schizophrenia, you know, go through the whole bit, are bodies that are really in states of threat and reactive, or basically totally numb. So it means that the underlying physiology of the autonomic nervous system is not supporting health growth and restoration. So I like to always make this simple generalization that when our body, our autonomic nervous system is supporting health growth and restoration, those homeostatic processes, that creates a platform that gives us the possibility of feeling safe. So we're not going to feel safe when our body is not supporting health growth and restoration. So we, once it does that, we have this opportunity. But once it doesn't, our body is now fighting for survival. So really it means that the initial intervention is calming the body. Is it always, see this is, I, I'm curious about this idea of whether we should start with the body yeah. Or start with the mind and our thoughts. Well, you can't really separate them because you have bidirectional communication. So the our intentional or our mental our images that we can uh, create affect our physiology. We can we can think of literally jumping out a window and we get a visceral reaction, or we can think of uh, you know uh, 
in the embrace of our loved ones and we get a smile. So we get physiological responses from top down. But what tends to be totally neglected is that there's so much bottom up traffic from, let's say, gut problems or uh, that, uh, that, that when we are in threat, it triggers or disrupts our physiology. So our gut doesn't work right. And that starts sending signals up that interfere with us, us even accessing these areas of our frontal cortex, which we really kind of talk right. about. That's our entire world. So when we're in pain, I mean, physical pain, we're not a very nice species. And often that physiological pain is not orthogonal or independent of our thoughts. We've numbed our body, we've turned off our feedback loops, and now the body's screaming for help. So how do you help the screaming body? Well, you create the context that acknowledges that the body's screaming because the whole person is not feeling safe enough. So you create the safe context, you calm the physiology, which really means you are sending signals top down to calm the body to say everything's okay, or at least better than you, your body's reacting. And then the body can start becoming, the term I use is the body, the body, the nervous system becomes a collaborator in a shared journey of health and restoration. Say that one more time. The body becomes a shared a, collaborator. A, co a collaborator in a shared journey of health, growth, and restoration. Now, I will tell you that but there's a backstory here. Several years ago, I was a finalist for a administrative job, administrative job at the National Institutes of Health, important job. And I was talking to the director of the National Institutes of Health. And I said to him, I said, you know, we know too much about the human body to allow, this is a very presumptuous statement to make, <laughs> to allow medicine to be practiced the way it is, which is really threat-based medicine, if you think about it. You scare people into compliance. You scare them into with diagnosis. I said, what we really should be doing is uh, trying to facilitate the collaboration with the client's nervous system, a shared journey in which it would support health, growth, and restoration, which we're working with the patient in this shared journey, basically uh, co-regulation in polyvagal terms. And of course, he didn't have a clue of what I was talking about, and I didn't get the job. But if I'd gotten the job, I probably would not have taken it because the community was not the community that would give me flexibility to do what I wanted to do. So I would actually be limited in to whom I could publicly give talks to and stuff like that. So I, I, it, was, it, it had worked out. But the interesting other part is he was a radiologist. And as a radiologist, of course, he wouldn't be thinking about co-regulation with a patient, he'd be thinking of looking at a image, you know? So it's like people's worlds tell you a lot of their worldview, what they do for a living, you know, what their specialty is, tells you a lot about who they are. Mm -hmm. If you could see, project forward the next 10, 20 years, what changes would you like to see in terms of the medical establishment oh, and our oh. approach towards trauma? Okay. So most people will say, oh, this is a horrible time, horrible, you know, all these things are going on. And I say, well, you know, let's step back for a moment and let's realize how many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are listening and interested in these types of questions now. So trauma is not something that's denied. It's, and trauma isn't just word trauma. It's adversity history and the retuning of a nervous system due to adversity and this desperate desire to learn how to optimize that retune nervous system as opposed to writing it off or denying that it, it's been damaged. So, uh, so I'm very optimistic on that. And the, I think the other part is we talk about medicine as being callous and not understanding what the patient wants, but there are so many physicians who are really anger, angry and up in arms about the medical profession as it is now saying that they are being robbed from what they want to do, and that is work with patients. So they're basically being, they're not, these are quotes from colleagues, friends of mine. We're not allowed to talk to our patients. We're allowed to do like eight or 10 minutes of diagnosis, but we can't talk to them. Um, now, I'll give you another a side story. This was a close friend who was a, uh, had a private uh, GP, medical 
profession, and we were discussing trauma. And he was not a trauma-informed individual, and he actually worked in a community that had a rural outreach. And you know, I was telling him all about these effects of trauma in the homes and stuff. So un, un, he didn't tell me, and unprepared to do what he did, he asked the next dozen of his patients, is there some, he said a simple question at the end of his examination, is there something that you'd like to tell me? And all of them told them about serious, profound abuse, primarily in the home. Now, he was kind of like a, a person who had this optimistic help. He was so greatly affected by it that it really, literally was massive trauma for him. And he had to get help, you know, in terms of dealing with this. And he was so upset. I remember talking to him on the phone and he said to me, this is a horrible world. I said, no, it's a wonderful world because we're here and we can do things. And this is the point I want to make is that we are here. I mean, you have this podcast. We're talking about these things. We are here. And we can understand what we're telling is really a narrative of what's happened to many people's bodies. It's not something that is, uh, let's say, crazy as used to be treated or so unusual. It's really saying that the body has become disrupted through an act that the body responded to in a predictable way. And this is the predictable consequence. Now, what our job is, is one, psychoeducational, and then psychotherapeutic. So we start to explain how we can do things to, in a sense, encourage the body to come back. The term I would like to use, encourage, it, enable re-embodiment. Because remember, with mm. these traumatic experiences, there's the numbness of the body. And what we're saying is that when you come back into the body and start feeling the body, what you're really saying is the feedback loops that are connecting those organs to your brain are now back functioning. So the feelings are telling you something about the efficiency and effectiveness of your nervous. Mm -hmm. I think uh, something I hear frequently from people who, who have had a trauma history and are feeling the prevalence or the effects of that in their current lives now, often feel as though their body is against them that their body is, they're pitted against them, that then it's not on their side and it's not operating, mm. as you say, in a logical way based yeah. on the experiences that they've had. And I think something that, there's a book by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey that I really appreciate because it's such a simple shift in the dialogue on this, starting to ask not what is wrong with you, but what happened to you? Like yeah. how can we shift into a place of, curiosity yeah. and acceptance and less judgment. I, I think what you're really saying is the, once the person makes this uh, evaluation that the body's against them, they really evaluate their body's valiant attempt to keep them alive. And they're really articulating that it got in the way of them doing normal things. And that's where addiction comes in and other types of uh, strategies or even high levels of medication because the body is really uh, it's screaming and saying, you got to listen to me. And I think this is really, you know, what, what Bruce Perry is talking about. It's similar to what I'm saying is that we can understand the adaptive reaction of our body and we need to, to honor it. We don't need to as a, suppress it. So the, the statement that you made that the body's against them is already as, uh, basically articulating the intention to negate the body's reaction not to honor it, not to respect, it, not to understand it, but to dampen it. Mm. Before we finish up, Dr. Stephen, I would like to bring this down really into practical strategies that people can take away to heal their trauma and forge mm. a new path. What do you think is particularly effective as a strategy in healing from these adverse experiences in our childhood? Well, it's always going to, in my, uh, basically my dialogue narrative is always going to be that we have to find the signals of safety that that nervous system is willing to accept. I think there are secrets along that journey. That is that uh, 
it may be easier to uh, basically recover if we incorporate movement with the signals. So dance and movement therapy, I think, is far more important when people, in a sense, it's easier for a nervous system to be social and engaging if it's already moving. That means it can get out of there if it's in danger. So that's really what the nerves, that's why play and dance and movement therapies are so effective. And while most of the psychotherapy has been basically uh, sedentary, so you sit down and mm -hmm. you interact, mm -hmm. but that's already enforcing a, a vulnerable nervous system to give up this mobilization strategy. So I'm saying sometimes you might need walk and talk as opposed to just talk. Uh, and, hey, and that's so the, a re that's a revolution. We should get yeah. a whole new era of psychologists who have a brand yeah, of walk yeah, and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, walk and talk, <laughs> but you know. I mean, that's part, I used to love to walk and talk, you know, it was like, uh, uh, you know, especially when we lived in Chicago, I just, that, that's go for a cup of coffee, walk and talk. That's good. Um, the, I think there, there are tools. So part of what I am working on now, I worked on an acoustic, a, uh, basically a music intervention called the safe and sound protocol which was really sending signals of safety to nervous systems, just like a mother's lullaby. And it basically stimulated uh, in others that engagement to engage others. Interestingly, if people had severe trauma histories, uh, at times, some of them, the signals of safety were triggers of threat because of their history. And that was a revelation to me because I thought this was really a reflex we could get people available. But what I learned was that that visceral reaction of availability was now associated with severe abuse. So the brilliant therapists learned how to use this. They basically titrated slowly and were able to walk, walk people through this. So the use of that was a tool that enabled people to give up a lot of their defensiveness. Now I'm working on another intervention, which we're calling polyvagal music, which is really music of the lower part of the body. So where the social engagement was this higher system of engagement, it's still metabolically demanding. But what is healing? Healing is not socially engaging. Healing is, is safe enough that you don't need to even reference the other person. You're safe enough in that space. And so it's the visualization I'm using is visualize yourself floating on in the ocean on a raft with the, on the, chance of falling off slow rhythmic movements and that's what the music is about as embedded in these compositions biological rhythms of the body and the body recognizes those rhythms and suddenly the person just becomes calmer so i think we okay so the new this, this is really what we're talking about when science starts giving us ideas uh that fit in with our own intuitive knowledge so science gives us ideas that we can, in a sense, duplicate this, the features of maternal voices that will calm us and make us engage. But science also informs us that our homeostatic function, are the rhythms of our body, are really slow rhythms, quite slow. Digestion is slow, vascular rhythms. I mean, these are in 15 to 30 seconds or even longer. But those rhythms can also be influenced by vocal, or not vocal, uh, uh, musical in, intonation and changes. So that's what I'm working on now. And so the notion is, can we create literally stealth medication and trigger the dorsal vagus, the vagus that regulates below our diaphragm to support health growth and restoration? Can we create music that helps our body heal? And that's, that's, that's where I think the future is, that what the portal, that we can literally create the portal to allow our bodies not really to be social, which I think is key to the survival of the species, but our physiology needs to heal. We're under threat too much. So our body needs some precious time to say, I'm giving all the defenses up. I'm now just floating in that visceral bodily sea to allow my organs to heal themselves. Mm, beautifully said. Dr. Seaman, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your immense knowledge with us. You're quite welcome. Thank you.